Um, so a really interesting part for me, you know, is that we set out on the project of the Sunda Shelf project and uh, we were farmers or hands as a ship's captain. I was running a farm with kids. You know, we've, we've packed that up. We've gone to do this research in Indonesia, which has just been basically put on hold. It hasn't been abandoned. It's been put on hold. We're playing with our equipment, which we could only do this because of the technology that we have today. Um, in the sense that side scan sonars were normally really big and we can pack ours in a suitcase and put it in the back of the boat. The equipment is, is all manageable on board for us. And research, doing research has become so easy today because of Google, because of the internet, because we're able to go into archival stuff. All of the information that I have gleaned about the Viscount Melbourne has come from the internet, has come from emailing experts in England and around the world. And they've come back telling me, I can't give you any more from our records physically in England than what you have gleaned yourself. And so that was a really exciting thing to know that we have gathered as much information that we can so far um, about the Viscount Melbourne, who was on board. Now, it's a difficult wreck. One, we were not divers. We were certainly not technical divers. And now we are both diving together uh, 40 metres. The, the, the maximum depth is 40 metres. We're actually not diving that deep all the time. It's unrecognisable, it's 170 years old, it's incredibly treacherous uh, we, where we are anchoring and how we are accessing, we have to be alert all the time to the situation, to the weather and it's worth it because we bring up these magnificent little tidbits that we have no idea what they were used for, their purpose. Uh, it's, it's necessary too though when we bring them up to try and identify them because we know from Harry's account and his Latin long positioning that this ship is laying in that position. However, we don't have a bell. Uh, we know that Salt Peter was on board now. We also know that Salt Peter uh, is incredibly corrosive to metal, but it actually preserves wood. And so for the amount of duration of time that the wood has been immersed in the sea, we actually have some beautiful pieces which appear to have been preserved and yet all of the steel that we are bringing up is actually affected almost as if it was helped along with the saltpeter. So we felt at first that what we were bringing up was fitting with Harry's um, account and so now the determination is to bring up as much as we can possibly hoping that we can find something that totally identifies that this is the Viscount Melbourne. And I feel that we've done that in a couple of the artefacts. We have, if I can bring you to um, a page that I have here, which is, we had, and I unfortunately, I only have the photograph because the bottle has actually been removed and that's another story. But this bottle has been identified as a milk feeder. And I don't know, how many other cargo vessels, ships that would be carrying passengers would actually have a woman with a two month old baby on it. And so we have to say, not 100%, but we have to say that there's a strong possibility because of this particular bottle. And also the farthings, we, it's definitely English. It's definitely an English ship because we are bringing off English coins from it. And the first artifact that we brought up, you know, was, a, a hand-blown glass bottle which was hand-blown I now know into a tri-mold and that fits this particular bottle fits also with that time period between 1780 and 1850 but it had a natural air bubble in it from being hand-blown and that bubble under the pressure burst but it revealed the fruit and inside was blueberries and that was, you know, for me, phenomenal to think that, you know, that fruit had been laying there. Not only was it preserved and not only was it not damaged from the wreck itself and the, the ship sinking from the reef down to 40 metres, and here it is. And that, I can tell you, was an absolute motivation for me to go and dive some more. That's what motivated me to get my diver's licence, to become certified and to become a diver. I wanted, it is 
the largest lucky dip in the world for for a woman for anyone it's 150 foot long it's 47 feet wide and you put your hand into that mud and you draw out really one magnificent little pieces